Hello everyone, Setakaibo here, and welcome to Spooky Bedtime Stories. We shall be talking about things that not many people know about or know much about. We'll be exploring the unknown and delving deep into imagination, even in the past. Our first episode today is Zombies where they came from, some of the folklore, and stuff about all of them from all over the world, pretty much. And how they came to be in our everyday lives and thoughts. So sit back, turn off the lights, light some candles, and be prepared for a good listen. Ghoul your classic ghoul is believed to be that of the souls of the dead that could return to Earth and haunt the living. It's also kind of believed that revenants, who we will be talking about a little bit more later, are also one of those that, who can return from the dead. And these guys are all documented in contemporary European writings of the medieval times. Now, according to an excitement or the encyclopedia of things that never were, especially in the uh, region of France during the Middle Ages, revenants can rise from the dead, usually to avenge some crime committed against them. Most most of the time, it's murder. The revenant can only take it on certain forms, like oh, you know, like a rotted corpse or a skeleton, and wander around graveyards at night. The Durger is another type of ghoul of the medieval Norse uh, mythology, and we'll get a little more into them as well later, were also believed to be corpses of warriors returned from the dead to attack the living. The zombies, while well, they appear in several other cultures worldwide, including China, Japan, the Pacific, India, and also here in the Americas. Now, there's one particular thing from a medieval writing from Europe that has been translated by a Miss uh, Kovacs. I'm not going to be able to say her full name because I don't want to mispronounce it. But the character is Ishtar is screaming this in fury and rage and vengeance. And this is the translation from... The Epic Gilgamesh of Ancient Summer. Father, give me the bull of heaven, so he can kill Gilgamesh in his dwelling. If you do not give me the bull of heaven, I will knock down the gates of the netherworld. I will smash the doorposts so and leave the doors flat down. And let the dead go up to eat the living. The dead will outnumber the living. And that is the end of your translation. That kind of reminds me of those who's done this vengeance thing before. Come on, really? You need to use zombies for your vengeance? D come on. That just me. No. No. Just no. Revenant. In the Middle Ages... It was common belief, commonly, I should say, believed that souls could return from the dead to haunt the living. It's believed that revenants, you know, someone who has just returned from being dead, were also well documented in what then, what was contemporary writings. According to, as I had said before, the encyclopedia of things never that, that never were, Revenants rise from the dead, particularly in the region of France during the Middle Ages, usually to avenge some crime committed to them, against them, like, you know, murder. I know, right? Really, coming back for the dead for vengeance because you are murdered? Come on. I understand, but nah. The revenants usually took on a form of a decaying corpse or a skeleton, and wandered around the graveyards at night. Hmm. Wonder if any murderers liked wandering around graveyards. That could always keep them from doing it. <laughs> Strigoi. 
In Romanian mythology, the Strigoi are souls of people who died and were never married. I mean, seriously? Seriously? Wow. So to avoid the corpses of rising or corpses rising again, it's necessary in the Romanian mythology to have the corpse married off to a living person of the same age who also has never been married. Now, if a cat walks closer to a corpse, it's certain the corpse will become a strigoi. Yeah, right, really? Okay, I've heard of cats walking your path, but this just, no. To avoid this a strigoi from hap, you know, like creating and happening, the Romanian society had some rules, like burying a bottle of grape juice close to the grave, where the, so, you know, I don't know, it's supposed to be some kind of barrier thing, I'm guessing. And after six weeks, people come back, unbury the bottle, and drink it. Now, it's supposedly believed that whoever drinks this bottle of fermented grape juice that's graveyard, that was fermented in a graveyard, will help prevent strigoi attacks on that person. Now, a way to recognize a strigoi in Romanian mythology is their red hair and blue eyes. They have some transforming skills. Hey, I wonder, right? <laughs> but they can turn into animals. And such animals as in, like, the owls. Hey, they must be some of the wisest of the zombies, huh? <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. Strigoi are actually human be What's also thought is some Strigoi were actually human beings with magical powers when they died and will come back and, I don't know, probably wreak, wreak havoc on society. But what they do to help prevent things like this is, you know, put a little money or a towel in the corpse's hand with, a, with the purpose of making sure it doesn't come up, also putting some nails into the corpse and a candle. Hmm. That's just a little on the odd side, but here's where it gets that you make the you may think that they're more like vampires with garlic on strings arranged in the into a circle is also considered a way to drive Strigoi away. There you go, your vampire uh, little clue there. Nuck zerer. Literally, the meaning of this guy's name is afterwards, not devour, zirir. Just, yeah, really? A devourer after death? Okay, makes sense. And it's a German translation, and this lovely little critter is in the German area. And it has similarities to vampires, They share, but they share more in common with you know, your normal zombie. But have, have several unique features. These guys usually feed on dead bodies, like your average ghoul, but also can feed on the life force of living beings, like wraiths. Who, oh, jeez. Man, I don't want to run into this guy. It also is said that they can devour themselves, but by in doing so, and, and this even includes their funeral shrouds, or shrouds, sorry, can't help that I mispronounce that, that they drain the life forces from their families. They also exhibit the powers of shape-shifting, you know, like turning into pigs or something to drain the life force of unwary people. Yeah, no, I, I don't want a vampire pig around me. No, thank you. But they also have the ability to kill with having their shadow fall upon a victim. And if they, you know, like, ascend a bell tower to ring the bells, anywhere hearing those bells ringing dies. Wow. Okay, that's just as bad as he hearing and seeing a banshee. Not cool. But one of the, what's considered one of the best methods of getting rid of these guys is putting a coin in their mouth or, you know, chopping their head off. Or, you know, the classic thing for vampires, hammering a stake through the heart. 
these creatures are usually created because of like suicides, accidental deaths, plague deaths, or it just so happens to that corpse just turned into one. Hmm. I'd want to know the certain circumstances for the it just happened to this corpse. Hmm. But one of the ways you can identify these guys in ancient times in the grave was the corpse holding its opposite hand or holding the thumb of in its opposite hand with its left eye left eye open. Hmm. Talk about a weird version of I see you. Jinginger. Now these guys, they're the Scandinavian version of a revenant. They typically are depicted as reanimated corpses from back from the dead to spread disease and to attack the living. Now these guys are usually made or created, so to speak, as a result of suicides, but also can be mainly also be victims of murder or the actual murderer themselves. Wow, these guys coming, a murderer coming back from the dead to spread disease. Right. No thank you. Now their intentions vary in different folklores depending upon the era. Ranging from creatures who require the assistance from the living so they can be at rest in their graves again, to deadly disease spreaders that can kill with an ill-inducing pinch. Well, now I know what I can tell my aunt. I don't want her pinching me because I don't want her spreading disease. They're featured also in Viking myth. And one of the ways that can be considered of getting rid of them or killing them is by carrying a coffin around a church three times using and or wearing um, crucifixes to ward off the creatures and or by carving scriptures into the grave of the dead and ha you have to make sure it's facing the body not sure how that works but hey it's worth a try right drugger the drugger is yet another scandinavian a dead creature from more of the norse mythology now these guys are dead vikings that have come back to life. Now these guys are pretty weird because they can attack and feed on the living and are capable of superhuman strength, increasing their size, um, and well have the classic scent of decaying flesh. Yeah, I would hate to be near that graveyard. Now these guys can crush their victims using their incredible size, eat them, or even suck their blood. They can also rise from the graves, or their grave, in a wisp of smoke. Now, that's interesting, especially if somebody's sitting near the grave and smoking a cigarette. Th that, that, that would confuse so many damn people. Now it's also said that animals who feed or linger near the grave of these guys eventually go mad. And I don't mean mad as in pissed off, I'm going to kick your ass kind of mad. I mean insane mad. Rabid. That kind. Of, yeah. No. I don't want to deal with those animals. It's said there's only one kind of person capable of getting rid of these guys. And it's a hero. One who possesses great courage and moral fire. Hey, there we go. Link, you got a job. Sorry. Bad, bad joke. They would often have to be physically wrestled back into their graves by this hero or beheaded or, you know, burnt and turned into ash, depending upon which myth you go by. Wealthy Vikings and noblemen who were buried with great treasures and come back as these guys guard their treasures better than a dragon. And th th that just, yeah. Smog comes to mind in this, and he's one of the greater dragons to protect his treasures. Huh. I mean, and these guys try can't go into the afterlife because they want to keep their gold and their treasures to themselves and will attack anyone who attempts to claim it.
Hmm. That's definitely worse than the dragon. Vetla. Now, Vetala are interesting because they're of Hindu mythology that haunt, like, chapel grounds or somewhere that's considered kind of holy or whatever. And they possess the bodies of the dead. Now, in these vehicles, I guess you can say, these guys like to harass the living, drive people crazy, kill children, and cause miscarriages. So if you're trying to, you're a woman and you're trying to start a family, whether you have a kid or you are pregnant and carrying, st stay well away from these guys. But something else that's actually kind of cool and good about these guys is they like to guard villages. Vitala aren't bound by laws of space and time, and they have the awareness of the past, present, and even the future and still remember the deep understanding that they had of human nature when they were alive. For this reason, a lot of times they're sought out by sorcerers as slaves. A way to get rid of them, to, or even help them go back to being dead, is reciting a holy mantra and performing funeral rites of the dead. Which, hmm, holy mantra. <laughs> Yeah, never mind. I'm so not touching that joke. Jang Shi. Jang Shi literally means stiff corpse. Now, these guys are considered zombie versions of vampires, in a way. Of Chinese myth. Yeah, I know. Kind of weird, but figured it was Chinese. Now, these guys are usually created because they're victims of murder or those who have committed suicide or just simply refuse to enter the afterlife. And they just don't want to leave their bodies. Which, I have to wonder, why would anyone want to refuse to go into the afterlife? This is like the second or third one that we've seen here, guys. Anyways, they have different appearances. And they can appear from just freshly dead yesterday to one of those moldy, rotten corpses that, well, what's depicted in Chinese mythology is white and furry. And it covers the whole body, so, hey, there you go. Maybe you got your yeti right there, guys. <laughs> Plus, it also has long white hair. And I'm guessing that's anywhere between the recently deceased to the moldy corpse as well. They are only capable of traveling by hopping, and it's silent hopping, so you kind of can't hear them. But they are capable of leaping great distances, and a way to keep them from attacking you is by throwing rice or coin coins on the ground. They will not pursue you if you do this because they will have to pick up every grain of rice or every coin so you can escape. Now, another way to get rid of these guys, besides using that little trick that you can use on the Fey, which that's another subject for a different time, is by placing a sacred piece of paper on their foreheads. Hmm. Sounds like somebody from an uh, anime that ne is needed for this guy. Pon Tai Nuk. Okay, guys, I'm not trying to repronounce this thing because it took me forever to re to pronounce it properly. But the word is kind of considered a bastardization of a different word, and the word, oddly enough, is Bahasa. Yeah, don't ask. And a major translation, or not translation, but major true name of this creature that's kind of gone down in history and not remembered, and forgive me if I mispronounce it, Pri Palman Mete Barakanak. And as I said, if I didn't pronounce that correctly, I am sorry, I will put the word up for you guys to try to pronounce it yourselves. But it also translates, that word translates in literally means, she who has died in childbirth. Now, these guys are of Indian 
or Indonesian and Malay, or Malay um, descent of mythology, where these undeads are literally women who died in childbirth. Yeah, don't want to mess with these kind of people, these kind of uh, zombie ghoulies, because these guys can be very vengeful as the undead, and will attempt to lure their victims with cries of a baby or even disguising themselves as beautiful women only to frighten and or kill their victims usually when they attack and kill their victims they use their sharp claws to tear out the guts of the victim devouring them to sustain their own life force but a popular way to get rid of them is to push a nail into the back of their neck or the apex of the head, which will forever have them stay as a beautiful woman until the nail is removed. What the fuck? That's no way to fucking get rid of them. That's no way to kill them. What the hell? You're allowing them to be around. Okay, I can understand letting them mourn about dying in childbirth and everything, but what the fuck? No. Bach. Okay, guys, literally, there isn't much to say about this actual ghouly ghost zombie thing because Bach literally translates to ghost whale and is literally, quite literally, a skeleton whale or a skeletal whale wandering around the seas around Japan and it brings bad luck to anyone who dares sail near it. Man, that. I feel sorry for Moby Dick. This guy's... Moby Dick ain't got nothing on this. Holy fucking shit. New Pepo. Okay, guys. The New Pepo is another one from Japanese mythology. But it's considered a formless undead yokai. That usually appears in, you know, like on temples or de deserted streets. Or even graves at sundown. And they usually walk around with, like, no particular place to go. But you guys get to laugh. These guys are only a foot and a half tall. Yeah. Along with the strong odor of rotted flesh. But, hey. At least these guys are more passive than anything because they're very calm creatures. It's somewhat also rumored that they eat or whoever eats the flesh of these guys will be young for eternity. Also, some people believe that this creature is formed by decaying flesh that's just been smushed and pushed together. Kind of like a chicken nugget where we don't know what kind of chicken meat's in there. Yeah, as I said, I these guys are at least the most passive. Geisha do Kuru. All right, guys. Another one that I forgive me. It took me forever to fucking pronounce before. Love pronouncing these, but this is another Japanese one that is an un lovely undead. But this lovely zombie type creature is a skeleton that is fifteen times larger than any normal person. And if they spy a human, they'll literally grab them and bite their heads off. These guys are usually created by the assembled bones of those who have starved to death out in the wilderness, from what I'm guessing, or even in small villages that have, you know, turned into ghost towns. As I said, yeah. The only way to avoid death is to flee before these guys can get a chance to get to you. The one thing that's just not cool about these guys or that they don't like is you can hear a ringing in your ears when one of these guys is close and about to strike so haha -ha, go for that but then again if you have constant ringing in your ears well you're a little screwed aren't you Izanami Izanami in Japanese mythology was actually the younger sister and wife to, now, forgive me if I'm pron pronouncing this wrong, but Izanagi. Now, she gave birth to five children in the islands of Japan and died giving birth to a sixth, which 
Izanagi killed in rage. Hmm. Jeez. Creating a number of deities in a, which when he killed the sixth child, aka the sixth island, he created many deities. In a myth that's similar to the you know, Orphus, uh, Orphesis, or whatever from like Greek. Izanagi is unable to deal with his grief and went to uh, Yogmi, or Yomi, the Japanese underworld, which I hear that's actually a way more badass than any of the other underworlds, but don't take my word for it, to revive or retrieve his beautiful wife, only to discover that she had become a worm-ridden, rot rotted corpse. Terrified, he fled from the now-dead goddess and the now dead goddess <laughs> chased him with um, eight vengeance hags. Now, I'm not sure what a vengeance hag is, but it does not sound good. When uh, Zanagi came to the entrance of the underworld, he sealed it with a boulder, and Izanami cursed Izanagi and threatened that if she were ever to escape, she would kill a thousand people a day, into which Izanagi furiously replied that he would create a hunt or a thousand five hundred more to replace those who he she killed. Hmm. Talk about a really bad breakup there. Hmm. Makes me really wonder if I want to be anywhere near Japan when the zombie apocalypse happens. A chitty. The Arcane, or Arc E, whatever, however you want to pronounce it, I know I'm mispronouncing it, but is of the Native American folklore of a little girl who died horribly in a sick death. It's also thought that she returns from the spirit world to live in the hills and the mountaintops. At night, she travels through the va valleys to spread shadow of illness of sleeping children. If that's the case, wow, why do the natives have such a thing? Ugh. I don't know which native tribe this is of, but I'm hoping it's not of the ones that I'm of. Zombies created by voodoo. Okay, picture this. A zombie in the sugar fields at twilight. Yeah, no, I can't picture that either. It's just, no. While stories of zombies are popular in American cinema since, you know, the 1960s, late 1960s, there's other things that we kind of haven't really thought of. Well, some people are starting to go there. The voodoo zombie. The zombies are created because of voodoo. Now, according to tenants of Vudan, a dead person can be revived by a boko, or a boker. It, believe me, it has several different pronunciations. These guys are also known as, and considered as voodoo sorcerers. Zombies remain under these guys' control since they have no will of their own. Now, another... Or... Hmm, how do I put this? Zombai is also another name for the voodoo snake god Dembala Wedo. Yes, I know I'm probably mispronouncing it. But it's from the Nigra Kagwa or Congo, origin, and is akin to the Congo, now Congo with a K, not a C, word Nizambi, which means God. There also exists a Vudan tradition that with the Zambi, not with an, it's only with an I, not an E, guys, an astral, which is a human soul that is captured by a boker and used to en enhance the boker's power. Now, there was some research done back in 1937 
in the folklore for Haiti, Zora, Nelana, Horstinda, in where they encountered cases of this thing, and I, as I said, or no, I shouldn't say this thing, this person who died and was buried back in 1907 at the age of 29. Now, the villagers believe this person was wandering the streets in a daze 30 years after her death. Oh, boy. What's the excuse nowadays? Is half of us freaking controlled by these voodoo priests? Anyways, and we're claiming, this, claiming that the same with several other people. Now, Huriston pursued rumors that the affected persons were given powerful drugs. Hmm. See, there you go. There you, they've got the right thought. But she was unable to locate individuals willing to offer much information. Now, this is something that she had put down in some of her research. It's kind of like saying a few things, and forgive me if I can't pronounce any of it, but I'm going to kind of give you a quick read through. If science gets to the bottom of this voodoo in Haiti and Africa, it will be found that some important medical secrets, still unknown to medical science, given it power rather than gestures of ceremony. Several decades later, Wade Davis in Can Canadian whatever, yes, I'm not pronouncing it, yes, I'll put up some of these words, presented a pharmaceutical case for zombies in two books. The Serpent and the Rainbow, a.k.a. one of the medical books that I just still can't understand, that was published in 1985, and The Passage of, da of Darkness, the ethnobology of the Haitian Zombie. Now, that was published in 1988. Davis traveled to a few of these different places in 1982, and as a result of his investigations, claimed that a living person can be turned into a zombie, yes, I spelled with the I-E, by two special powders, being entered into the bloodstream, usually via a wound. The first power strike, I guess you can call it, induced a death-like state because of TTX. Don't ask. I'm just giving the shorter versions that they're showing me here. And it's the key ingredient. TTX is the same lethal toxin found in Japanese... Um, Delixi, uh, Delixi, uh, Fuji, Fuji, or puffer fish. Wow, okay. That's a new one for you folks. At non-lethal doses, uh, which there's a formula here that I'll flash up on the screen for you, it can leave a person in a state of near death for several days. While the person continues to be conscious, the second powder composed of something like, a uh, uh, bleh, if I can even pronounce this, Datura put in the person, or put the person in a zombie-like state where they seem to have no will of their own. Now, this Davis guy also popularized this story that someone else had come up with, who was claiming to have succumbed to this practice. There's reason remains considering skepticism. I'm sorry, I'm gonna push right through this, guys, because there's a lot to read here for this voodoo zombie and the zombie drug that they're talking about here. Now, there's a lot of skepticism about Davis's claims, and opinions remain divided as to you know his work and how valid it, valid it is. Although there has been wide recognition among the Hayden people of the existence of the zombie drug. And no, this one is spelled with just the I, guys. The Vurun religion began, or being somewhat secretive in its practices, 
and codes can be very difficult for foreign scientists to validate or even invalidate such claims. So, yay, go for that one, right? Others have discussed contributions of the victim's own belief system, possibly leading to compalis, which the attackers will, and causing psychosis and what amnesia and whatever else with psychological disorders and things like that. To supposedly think that they're being returned from the dead. A Scottish uh, psychiatrist, I do I believe is a psychiatrist, since I'm not sure I'm reading the word right here, uh, Ligon, and I, yeah, I'm not even pronouncing that, right, I know it, further highlighted the link between social and cultural experiences and things like that that suggest it's more of a mental illness and than anything else, but there's a f no other proof that there's anything other than psychology involved. So there you go, there's on that one. And as I said, I am so sorry for the screw-ups on those. Okay, with this, we're going into a little more detail with zombies. Now, not every bite victim fits the traditional definition of a zombie. Unless infected by some kind of pathogen, or subsequently becoming d diseased and reanimated with a hunger for the living, a human cannot be turned into a traditional zombie. Examples are best shown in 28 Days Later and Quarantine. In 28 Days Later, the victims are infected with a rage virus. And in quarantine, the virus is linked to rabies, only with symptoms that show in minutes or hours instead of months. But in both cases, the victims will turn while still alive, while the virus infects the brain, inhabits the blood, it will not, and it will not physically change the body. While losing with... Well, well how do I put this? While losing that which makes them human, you know, mental thought, proper mental thought of, hey, hi, that's Joe, I'm going to go over and say hi, and have the thought process of, oh, Joe, food, brains, eh. That's the kind of what would lose people, or not exactly want them to go after it. There's also the rage of, hey, I want to kill the motherfucker. They can't even recognize other people who are like them, except for, you know, who are also bite victims. Hmm. The infected can be killed by any normal means by an uninfected human, and will starve to death without the instinct to feed itself for sustenance. Hmm. Honestly, rage, zombies, and living people. Don't mix, honestly. This is the part where I get to have fun, guys, because I'm going to be talking to you guys about the classic traits of our zombies. Now, in popular culture, in pop culture and movies and other stuff like that, depicts zombies to have evolved into a relevantly consistent archetype generally considered to be... or not considered, but consistent with the Romeo zombie and characterized by the following traits. A body composed of decaying human flesh that has subsequently reanimated, usually because of a virus and viral infection increasing the brain while the body is still living. Reducing speed of movement relative to normal humans. However, some recent theoretical theatrical, I should say, depictions of zombies portray that they can move as fast as a healthy human or even faster, depending upon what's going on and depending upon the virus. And it's due to the pos it's also possible due to the decaying muscles, you know, leading to the slower movement or adrenaline or something, leading to quick movements. 
there's other things that kind of depend upon it and depict it for speed. Increased endurance, well, okay, that's a kind of a given. Some sources say attributes of this to, you know, the removal of the normal neurological limits of to muscle endurance and things like that. This could mean, you know, the middle the inability to feel pain at times as they are not affected by the nerves. Profound reduced and abs- absent cognitive function as in, you know, normal thinking. Impaired eyesight, hearing, or smelling. However, they are also known to be attracted to bright lights or noises, possibly possibly meaning that they may instead be highly sensitive to them. Some are even believed that zom- or some even believe zombies are attracted to anything that makes noise, which is widely supported and seen in a lot of films like well, a lot of films and TV shows like, you know, The Walking Dead, Night of the Living Dead, things like that. And they also have this endless desire to consume living animal flesh. Usually more human animal flesh. Especially favoring the brains. Yeah. Some depict zombies simply possessing the just pure desire to kill. Not even having the hunger. Lack of human biological functions such as sleep, digestion, sexual function, or even few other things which... Wow, really? You're going to bring sex into this? We already know zombies don't have sex unless you're watching a really, really bad porn. Yeah, I know. The lack of human biology requires such conventionals as food, sleep, and even oxygen. Supernatural resistance to Im- or immunity to such traumatic injuries of any part of the body except to the brain. This is mainly due to the death of their nerves, which makes them unable to experience pain or irritation. Which, can I have one of those, please, so I like can not be irritable when I wake up? Coffee's always the best thing to keep me from being zombified. But these guys are vulnerable to attacks that remove the head or destroy the brain. Some butt zombies are depicted also to be vulnerable and power, or vulnerable to powerful attacks. You know, crushing the body, high calibrator shots, which also kills them outright. But the simplest way still is to remove the brain, A.K.A. chop off the fucking head. Yes, headshots are also welcome. And they do have high aggression with little intelligence. As in, okay, think of Sheldon Cooper turned into a zombie. Brightest, greatest scientist in the world. Reduced to absolutely nothing in intelligence. That's what I mean by very little intelligence. But they do have some traits of someone who's rabid from rabies. They ignore the uh, oblivious or they ignore or oblivious to fellow zombies. Sometimes it all depends on where you go and what depiction you're going on. In some depictions, zombies can be seen eating others, other, or, uh uh-huh. Let's put it this way. They can eat other zombies if there's a lack of living humans. In the case of the video game Resident Evil, um, Operation Raccoon, which, yes, got, or Raccoon City, sorry. Which I do plan on playing that at some point, guys. I do plan on it. Don't ask me when. But I do. And But it seems that they still will always favor humans over themselves. When, and if they sense a human getting closer, well, that's your own fucked up fault. Alright, guys. Now, there's a couple other things I'd like to bring up. Like the... How these zombies came to be. There's a wonderful guy called... Um, uh-huh, if I can find his name again, I will be able to read it to you. The guy who originally created zombies in 
the 1960s. Call it 1968 to be exact. He's the one... He started with... Um, he actually started with White Zombie where he brought ghouls into play. And the guy's name is Ramos, or Romeo. George A. Romeo was the director of uh, White Zombie and, of course, the classic film that truly brought zombies into being in 1968, The Night of the Living Dead. Now, these guys, as I said, are the ones that brought zombies into being, into our movie and media of today. And this guy actually done pretty good. And he did his research. So, I'd say give him that. Just watch out for any classic zombies out there. Hello everyone, Sedek here. I hope you enjoyed this little thing of reading for me. I tried to do my best, and yes, in some of the longer parts, I unfortunately did screw up with some of the words I was trying to pronounce, and I didn't want to go back and re-record everything that I had said and re-read, or re-read at all, because it was going to get annoying to me, so I apologize for that. Thank you so much for sticking through this. Please let me know what you think. I'm sorry about some of the bad jokes as I was reading at some of the different types of zombies. But, hey, at least, as I said, I was trying. Thank you guys so much for being here. Let me know what you thought of these this lovely spooky bedtime stories. And let me know what you want and think for the next episode. Thank you again so much. Put it in the comments below what you think and any suggestions you want for the next spooky bedtime stories. Again, thank you all. Stay spooky and make sure to check under your bed so there's no spookies under there. Bye!